Hey guys, so today I am going to be making something of a 101 video where I talk about why I choose to use GNU Linux based operating systems on my desktop computer over the more well known Microsoft Windows based operating systems that most people seem to run. Now this video is basically me explaining not only the premise of this channel but the reasons why I do so many things in my life as well because my life sort of at this moment revolves around tech not only sort of on a personal uh, level but also on a uh, sort of professional level as well I make my money through tech and also on a sort of political level as well because as you guys know I am I guess you call me a political activist but considering I sort of like stand in elections I guess you call me a political candidate at times as well so all of this kind of feeds into it, so it's a big thing for me, which is why this video might be a little bit rambly. It's like the most comfortable medium I feel sort of explaining this kind of thing as well. Um, also, feel free to ask any questions down in the comments section below. I will either try and answer them down in the comments section below uh, or... Uh, possibly even make another video sort of clearing up any possible confusion with this. Uh, again, also, I'm going to apologize if any of the terminology and topics that I cover in this video are either too technical or possibly sort of oversimplistic, depending on, of course, whoever it might be watching this video, but I'm going to try and give this video as broad an appeal as possible. So let's begin at the beginning which kind of makes sense. What is an operating system? Well, um, two examples, of course, are GNU Linux and um, Microsoft Windows. Uh, well, Microsoft Windows, of course, has various different, different iterations, Windows 8, Windows 8.1, Windows 10, going back, you've got Windows 7, Vista, XP, ME, 2000, whatever. Um, and with GNU Linux, which for the remainder of this video, I'm going to be talking, uh, I'm going to be referring to as just Linux. I know a lot of people don't really like that because it's um, sort of in a, a terminological inaccuracy, but it will stop me from tripping over my words as much. So I sort of just want to sort of set that precedent here now. Uh, and there are lots of different versions of Linux based operating systems. Uh, the one that I personally use is one called Linux Mint, but the most well known desktop one I would say is Ubuntu. Uh, but you've also got um, other ones like uh, Fedora, Red Hat, OpenSUSE. So there are a number of Linux-based operating systems as well. Um, different Linux-based operating systems generally get made for either different pers uh, different sort of audiences or different purposes. Um, so you might have more corporate-based distributions which might be sort of um, used in office buildings or in a corporate environment. You've got ones like Linux Mint, which are very much designed for home desktop use as well. And whereas by and large, nine out of 10 times um, software available for one distribution or one, which is basically one version of Linux, will work on another version of Linux. That's not always true. And there's a lot of nuances here. Um, but there is a common um, kinship between various Linux distributions. That being said, um, another example of an operating system, of course, is Android, which is nearly exclusive on tablets and phones. Uh, you can get Android on um, the desktop, but it's uh, it's really not very good on the desktop. There's not really much much point on it as well, um, and uh, it doesn't tend to get lum, lum, uh, doesn't tend to get bundled in with the other Linux distributions because it's so different. It doesn't use the GNU uh, infrastructure as well. It just uses uh, a common um, part of the operating system called the kernel. So. Um, yeah, and Android is uh, Android is an example of an operating system. iOS is an example of an operating system as well. If you have an Apple phone, um, or for some reason you've decided to hack your your non Apple phone to have iOS, I don't even know if that's possible. Uh, but I know that you can you can actually run the uh, operating system that's run on Macs on PCs as well. I think they refer to that as a hackintosh, which is uh, it's always a concept that that is that has amused me. I've never tried it myself. Um, so yeah, these are platforms um, that you use to run other software on. This software might be games, it might be your your word processor, it might be your internet browser, it might be your email program, but all of these things sit on top of an operating system and that operating system then sort of talks to the computer on, on your behalf as it were. It effectively, in its most simplistic terms, translate what the computer is saying and what the computer is doing into language that you and I can understand. So. What is the prime? Uh, what is the? 
where to begin now? Microsoft Windows is the operating system that 9 out of 10 people have. Um, it's by far the most well-known one, and if you buy, buy a PC from the shops, uh, you are more than likely going to have Windows pre-installed on it. It is effectively the default operating system of the PC. Um, almost in a similar vein to how Android is the default operating system for phones that don't come from Apple, um, as an example as well. Uh, it's the most common, it's the most well-known used operating system, but it's not necessarily the best, and obviously what qualifies something as being the best is subjective or dependent, depending on what you intend to use it for. So... Uh, why have I decided to remove Windows from my computer and put Linux on top of it? Actually, I didn't do that. I built my computer from scratch, and so it never actually had uh, Windows as a primary operating system on. Um, okay, so to clear, actually, to clear one thing up now, just the first technical inaccuracy that I've said, uh, is that I don't actually exclusively use GNU Linux-based operating systems. I do something called dual booting. I have two hard disk drives in my computer, one that is used f uh, for Windows 8.1, and one which is running Linux Mint 17.2, Matei edition, if uh, any of you guys are wondering. I'm actually, you know, circling around various different desktop environments, and the Matei version, I'm really enjoying it. Actually, it's a really good, stable um, desktop environment. So, the difference between Linux, Microsoft, Windows. Uh, the biggest, most notable difference is that Linux-based operating systems tend to be open source. So what is, of course, open source? Again, in its most simpli simplistic terms, when an operating system is built, the instructions and the uh, everything that is required to make said operating system is available to um, sort of review, audit, inspect, take away. You can even improve it. You can do whatever you want with it. But the fundamental importance is that you know down to every line of code how your operating system is put together. That is the importance that I personally get out of it, but I know that there are a lot of other people who um, derive other usefulness from having access to the source code. But to me, the reason why open source is at least relevant in regards to an operating system is that you know what is actually on your computer and you know what is made up of the software that is running your computer. That way you know that there aren't necessarily um, security vulnerabilities or that security vulnerabilities can be patched by any number of people that might want to improve the operating system. Um, it's also um, that you actually know, again, it's a matter of consent and knowledge. Um, it's very difficult to really give consent to running a piece of software on your computer that you don't actually know what it does and without access to the source code you can never really be that sure on what a piece of software does. I do make a number of concessions based on this. I have a NVIDIA graphics card and I run proprietary drivers on it but um, there are these are concessions. They're not it's not ideal but it's it's a it's sort of a concession that you have to make. Um, but wherever possible, I try and make sure that the source code is available for any piece of software that I'm using. Um, there are some, again, some exceptions that I personally make to this that I know other people aren't willing to make. The big notable exception is games. Uh, I love playing games on Linux. In fact, one of the biggest um, sort of... Uh, positives of playing games on Linux and getting involved in um, the Linux gaming community is that it is basically what the mainstream gaming community was 15 years ago when people were significantly more enthusiastic about games when there was so much more new stuff being tried out and it kind of feels a little bit like that on a certain side of the indie gaming scene not all indie games some indie games um are Unity asset flips and just trying to cash in for a quick buck. But one of the natural safeguards that an indie development team actually cares about their game and cares about their game um, to an extent that they want as many people to play it as possible in whatever way they want to play it as, uh, you know, as possible it is, the in, is, is when an indie game makes a game available for Linux. Because no one makes a game for Linux for the big bucks. No one makes, um, you know, there's there's no real money in it. The reason why a developer would, would port a game to Linux is simply out of enthusiasm for their own game. So there is that kind of safeguard that if you've ported a game to Linux, there's a very real chance, and this isn't applicable in every single case, but I've certainly noticed it's applicable in enough to be merit of note. 
that there is this degree of enthusiasm and pride in a game that you want to port it to as many different platforms as possible. And therefore, games that are available on Linux tend to have this natural form of quality control, which I think is really, really quite good. Um, and I've been playing... Some of the fan most fantastic games that I've been playing lately have come out of that sort of sector of the, the indie scene, the same sector where, like, Don't Starve and Neon Struct, and I think it's the Master Plan have come in, where they're games that are just trying new stuff in the same way that big game developers were trying new stuff 15 years ago, most notably, of course, Deus Ex. That was the era Deus Ex came out. And, uh, yeah, okay, you know, games like Neon Struct will go back 15 years they will look at what was good about video games and then they will try and bring some of that stuff forward rather than just again trotting out a franchise it's also so much more new intellectual property in indie games as well in a world where we see you know sequels upon sequels and franchises just go on forever fast and the furious 27 uh, a new you know like e3 the stuff that most people were excited about was there's going to be a new game of your favorite franchise Again, I kind of like that. You know, I, I love the Fallout games. I like uh, Deus Ex, Man, you know, Mankind Divided looks really good and all this kind of stuff. And from a game's perspective, yeah. And, you know, to a degree, maybe that's a, um, a failing on my part that I've just sort of kind of got swept up in the exact same hype that I'm actually trying to get away from. But again, you know, that's just one reason why at least gaming on Linux is something that I've actually really quite enjoyed lately. Um there are, yeah, so Linux is, is significantly more secure as well. Um, now, this is a difficult one to, to argue because it actually is becoming less and less so as time goes on. Um, Linux used to be so... Um, Linux has not got less secure. Let me just sort of say that now. Um, but the way that uh, unscrupulous people are trying to take advantage of you and, and whatever vulnerabilities that you might have is changing. Um, and I think the biggest threat to your um, sort of online safety, mostly, let's say, your bank balance, uh, what's stopping you from getting robbed um, is not on the desktop end of things anymore. It's not on the software side. It's it's going to be um, sort of a an online issue, which means that it doesn't matter what operating system you're running, you're still vulnerable from things like phishing, um, which is when people set up a, a website that looks just like maybe your banking website or Facebook or whatever, uh, in the hopes that you will enter your username and password into it, and then it, instead of going to Facebook, it will go to someone who you don't want it to go to, and they can use that to take out money from your account. And yes, you can actually take money out of people's PayPal accounts with a Facebook username and password as well. I actually had it done to me. Fortunately enough, though, PayPal was actually good enough to, um, to, to actually revert the transactions, which actually worked out really, really well. Um, of course, I'm not on Facebook anymore, but that's a different story. Um, but yeah, in, in regards to security, I mean, it is secure. I've never had a virus on a Linux machine. Um, and I've deployed dozens of, yeah, do dozens of Linux um, machines in my time. It's just something that doesn't happen. Um, and it's because, part of it is because people develop viruses and malware for, like, the most commonly used operating system. So there is some degree of, of security through obscurity. But also because of how um, different programs and how things are allowed and how permissions of various different software and safeguards and all that kind of stuff work in Linux. It, it, if you have any kind of sort of comprehension of your operating system, um, y there is not actually a way that a, that a virus can actually sort of break your, your computer in a way that it can do with Windows. But that being said, though, um, like I say, the biggest threat to you and your bank balance is, is probably online, and that's where you need to... Um, to to install the most security nowadays anyway um so is it is it better really um is linux a better operating system or a linux is is it a better set of operating systems uh this is difficult to say this is difficult to say um because i don't use linux because it's better some ways it's better. Some ways, like I say, it, it, you can argue that it's more secure, although, again, that's not necessarily super applicable nowadays. Um, but but I don't necessarily... I don't use it because it's better. 
Um, I, I the reasons that I've actually that I use it have changed over time, which is actually quite interesting. I initially start, originally started using it just because I wanted to to learn about it, to expand, to um, to sort of out of curiosity, out of no other reason than just sheer curiosity. And this was back first time I picked up. It was a, a copy of Seuss on the front of a magazine, Linux format, I think it was. Um, and I just wanted to, to to dual boot and have a go just for the just for the fun of it, just for the just for the intellectual curiosity as well. Really quite enjoyed it. Um, and uh, uh, they still used KDE as their main desktop operating uh, desktop environment, which is interesting. Um, so then I tried that out, and, and um, I got to admit it was it was it was a lot more difficult back in those days. It was a lot more difficult back in those days. Um, and and again, better is subs- um, is incredibly subjective as well. Uh, li- I still maintain that Linux is an operating system that requires someone knowledgeable within the vicinity of its deployment. And what I mean by that is, I have friends and family who who use Linux as well. Um, I know someone who had a terrible old computer, and they were thinking about throwing it out and buying a brand new one for about four or five hundred British pounds. That's what seven eight hundred American dollars. Um, and I said to them, before you do that, let me load Linux onto it. Right, this was an XP machine, and it was going to be unsupported and 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 running an XP machine after the support has run out on it. Um, is incredibly dangerous, of course. Um, and in fact, some I think some banks have actually said, you know, when you, please don't visit our website if you're running a, an out of date operating system, of which XP is now. Um, so they, so uh, yeah, I said to them, uh, yeah, if I if I can install Linux on it, give it a go for a couple of months. Let me know how you get on. If you have any troubles whatsoever that can't be easily remedied, then go and buy a new computer. You're not out of pocket. I'm just fixing an old machine up for you, uh, which they've still got, still use. Zero problems, zero problems whatsoever. Oh, there was there was one minor one minor problem because it was an old machine, an old XP machine. Uh, it had um, um, I, I put Ubuntu onto it, so which is the LXDE variant of Ubuntu, a lightweight operating system designed basically to replace Windows XP and to revive uh, old hardware. The uh, one minor problem was that the uh, the exit button to shut down the operating system. Uh, was in the bottom right hand corner of the screen and when a window was maximized you'd have the the scroll down arrow just like right above it so if you weren't paying attention you could accidentally click the shut down button uh, instead of the scroll down button uh, because the mouse in question doesn't actually have a mouse wheel so um, uh, so so uh, it was just a matter of well you know we'll get rid of the shutdown button you just go to the start button or the the menu button and then just go log off shut down you know it's it was it was a, about as easy to remedy as you can imagine um but it, other than that piece of cake job done you know it was it was you know i might not necessarily have saved them the 400 pounds because it could just be in a couple of years time when maybe the the hard disk drive gives out or the memory gives out and then they have to buy that computer again but i've sort of offset it you know if i've certainly made certainly um you know it's a benefit it's a good deployment of linux but with that in mind um i you know i'm i'm a phone call away so if something did go wrong they had that kind of personal support there and i don't know whether or not if someone wanted to try linux out for the first time and who might not have been super tech savvy and if something goes wrong they might not necessarily know how to fix it i i think that there is a possibility they could kind of be left in the wilderness there uh there is some pretty good support for for linux out there there's like irc channels and chat and social media reddit is actually i found to be really really good for uh finding people to, to sort of help you fix any kind of problems um uh, but that being said, you kind of have to have that um, that that sort of that 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 willingness to learn that some people just don't have these days. And I think maybe you could argue that that very much is a fault of society and and, and our day and age. But it's it doesn't you know acknowledging that might not make it any less of a problem. But I could very well possibly end up saying that Linux at this moment isn't really for everyone because um because i think you still do require this sort of degree of knowledge to get it working to to a specific standard um and that knowledge is takes time to learn and um and and and, and 
you know, I don't know. I don't necessarily know what the solution is off off the, the top of my head here, but um, but the, but but to to say that that someone who just has very little knowledge of computers could hop into Linux and just 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 run at it, uh, no problem. Um, and and uh, it's it's not really true, um, especially if they they come into bugs or incompatibility, or you know even knowing or not knowing whether or not Windows software will run on Linux as well. Some people don't know. Um, and 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 that's again something that might need to be taken into account. There is light on the horizon on that side of things. Actually, is because like the likes of Windows and uh, are moving towards an app store for the desktop, or have moved to an app store for the desktop. The idea of repositories and the idea of how software is put onto your operating system is becoming a little more universal. Um, then, of course, there's. Um, there's that, and I do know that there are a lot of cross-platform efforts as well in terms of package management, um, which could very well bear a lot of fruit in the future. Um, so when it comes to Linux being better, it's better for me. Like my desktop runs faster than than when it runs on its Windows partition. I only ever use the Windows partition to play games. That's the only thing that I do. I have in the past used it for video editing, but um, Linux Mint is really quite good at video editing for at least my purposes, so I don't really use that anymore as well. Um, so it is it is pretty much only games, and I think the last time I booted into it was about two weeks ago. So that's just to give you just to give you a bit of an idea. Windows 8.1 could very well be the last version of Windows that I actually end up using because I think Windows 10 is going to is is not going in a direction that I like and that's going to lead me to sort of the final um the final point on uh on 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 my thoughts on sort of operating systems and, and linux based operating systems it's the most important point so if you've made it this far into the video um thank you um i guess um and that is the idea of software software rights and digital autonomy. The idea that um, you are in control of your desktop, uh, that you know what your desktop is running, like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the idea of open source as well. Uh, and the idea to successfully control your operating system as well. One of the things that I really don't like about Windows 8.1 is because I only boot into it once every week, once every two weeks, right? And there are plenty of other people that, that, that use their computer that often who might have Windows 8 or 8.1, right? Maybe some like elderly people that only do it, use it to, to do online shopping or to email the, the grandkids or whatever it, it might be. And they might use the computer once a week or you know that kind of time frame. And every time I boot into Windows, every single time I boot into Windows 8.1, updates. And not even like one or two updates. It's like 30. It is not uncommon for me to boot in, play a game, and then have to spend literally half an hour upgrading a system with no visible benefit. Which really does annoy me. There's no way out. There's no, there's no, there's no way I can avoid it. There's no way I can get rid of it. It's there. It's, it's in my face. It's not letting me choose when I want to upgrade, what upgrades I want to do, how I want to upgrade, when I want to upgrade. No, it wants to upgrade then. It wants to upgrade, you know, when it wants. It wants to upgrade what it wants. Uh, completely outside of my control, and I think that's really quite irritating as well. Um, what I do when I um, set up a uh, like a Linux computer for a friend or family member or someone I know um, is that I will only let set it to update when I am physically at that computer. So I won't have the update manager on startup or anything like that because it um, updating is a process that can actually end up breaking your machine. So it is always good that if you're going to do any serious up updates to sort of either know what you're doing or be with someone that knows what they're doing or at least be in a position where the update, you can afford the update to fail or whatever it might be. Um, but then I just update whenever I, I sort of personally visit them and then it sort of works. And I've never had a single problem in all the years that I've been I've been doing that. Um, because people don't want to have an update window flash up in front of them um, Offering to solve problems they have no idea exist. So there's there's that kind of thing. You know, you can actually choose. And I uh, like on on Linux Mint, for example, is that it gives you a priority order on what your upgrades do, and uh, which upgrades might be like unnecessary or um, might not necessarily be super stable to upgrade at this point in time. And it actually gives you a decent explanation and most importantly, the choice on what you want to do and when you want to do it. That is the most important thing. In fact, I, I like how Linux Mint chooses to do its updates. It never it never does a pop-up. It has an icon in the system tray and it goes 
from a green tick to like a blue exclamation mark, and that's when updates are available. Click on it, and it tells you what updates are available. And I only up I only update when there's something that I see that I want to update. That's it's as simple as that. It's as easy as that. Um, but again. Part of that is the privilege and prerogative of actually knowing the ins and outs of my system. Something which Linux allows you to do. Something which Windows deliberately hides from you, um, and it hides it in the in the in the, um, in the excuse that might at one time have been valid of user friendliness. But now people are already required to know so much about computers that they use. They teach um, IT at least in, in in British schools as well, um, and how to use computers. And um, that includes things like how to, you know, you know, we need to know um, formulas for spreadsheets. We need to know how to use, um, how to protect ourselves online, um, how browsers work and how plugins for browsers work and all of these little bits and pieces that make up our operating system. So I don't really think that it, it is too much of a stretch to actually have people sort of informed on, again, some of the more fundamental parts of their operating system. Um, but the, I think there just lacks a mechanism and, and a way to do that. Part of that is because Linux and open source, in a way, the community is almost too smart for its own good. Um, and I see this in politics quite a lot as well, is when you have a community of people that are really intelligent, there is often this disconnect between really intelligent people and um, <laughs> and, and people who are, who are not particularly uh, achieved in that department, if I might be as, as politically correct as I can be. And sometimes you require... Uh, you know, sometimes there's a requirement for, for PR to actually explain these um, reasonably intricate and nuanced um, ideas to so to your man on the street, basically, to someone who might not have that much of an interest in it as well. Which is, you know, again, going back to why, why Linux isn't necessarily for, for everyone at this point in time. I'd love to see it become universal. I really would. And I'd love to see the community, the community take these kind of steps to make more people um, be able to use Linux... Uh, without having to be sort of um, taught by a specific person. Um, because this, again, comes down to digital autonomy. The right to use software the way you want to use it, to know what software it is you're running, to be able to control that software, um, and to be able to choose as many from as many different options and factors uh, as possible. And that's really what it comes down to, is choice. The ability to use your computer and the software on your computer in the way that you want to without interference from anyone else you know it's the right to use your property as you see fit um and it's and and, and linux and the linux community really celebrate that and that's why i choose to be a member of it and why i choose to sort of engage in it and why i choose to make these videos on this channel and why i'm so passionate about it is because because it, it it is very much uh, a case of um of of protect of protecting some what are really very fundamental rights surrounding this as well you see what's known as the general public license or abbreviated to gpl which is a software license that most uh sort of linux uh open source software is is licensed under is um and i'll link to it down in the description below but it's i, I want to refer to it as a set of terms and conditions and i guess in theory they kind of are but they're also a list of rights that you have and the also the developer of that piece of software has and the people involved in that software have but the idea behind the gpl is to protect like rights uh, some of those rights are your rights that are being protected and some of them are from the developer. But they're rights that are being protected. Whereas the sort of the Microsoft Windows equivalent, what's commonly known as a EULA, an end user license agreement, is a document or documents explicitly designed to restrict your rights and do nothing else. Nothing else. And if anyone who's made it this far through a through the video who might not be necessarily very technically savvy, and I know the number of people might be very slim on that front, considering considering a lot of the terminology and tangents that I've gone off onto, um, might, but the the thing that I couldn't I, I couldn't sort of make more important 
is to to read the terms and conditions of those end user license agreements that people just sort of sign click i agree and just think nothing more of it um particularly when it comes to microsoft windows actually because the microsoft windows I think it was the Microsoft Windows 10 EULA, but it could very well appear in the 8 and 8.1 EULA as well, um, that actually says that this operating system reserves the right to collect information um, based on your input, um, and it sort of leaves it at that. It's basically protecting Microsoft's right to take your information and whatever information you choose to, to input into your operating system. That's a big right that you've just given up, to use a piece of software that you've paid for, but still don't actually own. It actually says also in the end user license agreement of uh, Microsoft Windows, you do not own this piece of software. This is a license. You are paying to let us, let you use our software. You don't own Microsoft Windows. No one owns, Microsoft owns every copy of Microsoft Windows because they license it out. They don't, they don't sell you a physical, like you do not own your software you do not own the software that your your computer runs on that's that's again that's something that's something very very noteworthy if nothing else um and uh, at least when it comes to linux and open source kind of stuff you own your sort of like copy of linux i guess you'd call it um it also kind of makes prominent that ownership in and of itself is kind of a weird uh, intangible concept i guess when it comes to to online stuff because you might own a copy of linux so you might own you know the linux mint software that's sort of on your machine um that's kind of like yeah not not super useful because it gets out of date and you know and 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 it sort of it is part of a larger ecosystem as part of the internet but again maybe not maybe like um like if you use a, a computer that's that's not part of the internet, maybe it's uh, like an arcade machine that wants to play sort of like old emulator games. I've seen that Linux deployed in that that uh, instance before, which is really kind of cool. Um, then I guess um, it's perhaps a little bit more relevant. Okay, so just to sum up, why I choose to use Linux, it really does come down to the fact that I really kind of want to protect my sort of digital autonomy and the right to use software the way that I want to use it. Um, I could talk a little bit about um, sort of how privacy as well is an aspect uh, in it and how in order to have a, uh, in order to protect your, your privacy, uh, open source software plays an incredibly important role in that. But that might be a video for another day because um, again, that's sort of a pretty far-reaching subject it is something that again is important it is something that that is factored into the decision but it's certainly not a um and if um and if i felt that that any of the uh, open source linux based software that i use does infringe on my privacy i would stop using it um but um but it to me it's not maybe not the most important aspect of it i think the most important aspect is the the digital autonomy and maybe that's you know and that is just me i mean i talk about this very publicly you know in video form on the internet so you guys have probably already um sort of fathomed that um i want to protect the right to privacy even though i've personally elected to give it up in a lot of ways i mean i stand for elections and you you pretty much open up your life to the general public at that point anyway uh not to mention that all this stuff that i put out on the internet as well you know i i i've pretty willingly uh, sort of given up my personal right to privacy but i will absolutely defend anyone's right to privacy um who chooses not to give it up you know you have a right to privacy if you choose to accept that right and that's again something very fundamentally important to me what what kind of concerns me the most out of all of this though is how little people are actually willing to question not just the kind of software that's on the computer but the world around them as well do you know what i mean like it's this it's this irritation that i have and it can't possibly just be me the the world is made up of so many people that just consume whatever's put in front of them not 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 questioning it and it is um it is epitomized by the trope of people just not reading end user license agreements it's it is you know it's uh you know and I, and I think that just sort of sums it up you know it's like if it's if it's 
uh, you know, financially free, gimme, 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 no questions asked. And I think we live in, you know, I think we do live in that world where, you know, if, if something's just given to you for free, you just sort of consume it, no questions asked. And, you know, maybe it's not even necessarily for free. You know, it's, it's, it's not, and it's not just, you know, software. Software is a part of it. Software is a big part of it. Um, but it's it's just general things in our life, like our, our you know our, what what we consume. We are a you know a society of consumers, and you know and I think that it's always important to question, you know where your your where your stuff comes from, where your stuff is made, you know whether or not your clothes are made in a in a sweatshop or in somewhere that actually pays their workers a decent amount. Um, you know where your food comes from, and whether or not you know uh, whether you know whether or not you, the source of your food is. Um, you know, is, is is sort of acceptable on your personal terms and conditions. Um, whether or not, for example, because um, I, you know, sort of on, on the political trail, I, it, you sort of, you, you, it hits very hard when, or it hits home very hard, rather, um, how so many people in our society just, like, get completely screwed over. And one of the groups of people that get screwed over more than any, more, sort of more than most, are farmers because they get completely screwed over by the supermarkets, which just hammer down their prices to the point where it's really difficult for them to make a living because the powerful, you know, sort of the massive uh, supermarkets have just basically crushed their ability to negotiate prices, and therefore, um, you know, it's it ain't good, it ain't good. So um, when it comes to sort of um, questioning where where things like your food come from again it's important um you know may, maybe you're perfectly happy with where your food comes from you know and it's not necessarily just about um you know it, it's a, it's about knowledge and it's about your personal knowledge it's not necessarily about your personal politics maybe you're fine with um you know sort of eating gm for example or maybe you're not or maybe there are certain elements to it that you don't like for example maybe the over centralization of the the economics of the situation or the lack of regulation or the um or maybe it's that um the environmental concerns that you might have or maybe it's um maybe it's the, it's it's the workers rights elements to it as well there are a lot of different sort of political factors that make up even just where your food comes from as an example or your electronics that they made in a sweatshop or your clothes that they made in a sweatshop um and, and it's a, it's important to question all of this stuff it really really kind of is but you know a lot of people will then sort of return by saying well there is so much stuff in our lives how do you expect us to what google every single item we own and i think when it becomes that um uh when it becomes that um, so that much of a mountain to climb maybe it's time to stop and think that we're actually consuming too much stuff <laughs> I don't know so uh, but question everything man you know I mean there are a lot of people out there who I disagree with on a political level right a lot of people a lot of people but but I still have this fundamental respect for them in the sense that they at least question the world and maybe their conclusions are not the same conclusions of mine but it's like seriously um it's it's a case of, of 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 just questioning and 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 and, and knowing and I, I have a feeling that i really am preaching to the converted when it comes to this one because there is this certainly this this feeling in the open source community and maybe it's why i kind of feel at home here as well um but again it it is this idea that we we you know we we should know as mu we should educate ourselves as much as possible um and whether or not that's educating ourselves on 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 the software that's running on our computer and the potential pitfalls of not knowing that and what um other people corporations criminals governments might have to gain from taking away our rights as well um you know it's it's something that we all need to be at least aware of you know it's it's the unquestioning um ignorance and consumption that really just uh concern me really because you know um it's this it's this expectation that if something was up someone would have done something about it and i the linux community are the people doing something about it but you might want to be on that particular lifeboat um when when your rights kind of get increasingly infringed upon um i'm not going to cover it in this video but the uefi nonsense that we've seen over the past six months about the possibility of of windows and microsoft taking even further steps to lock out any kind of competition as well um again somewhat concerns me um there will always be the ability to get a linux pc i have no doubt about that but the fact that you can actually go down to your local um 
computer shop, buy the bits and pieces to actually put to compu- uh, put a computer together, and then put Linux on on it. Um, is something that I quite like. Uh, if they start putting that Windows secure mandatory secure boot, boot on even things like motherboards that you buy from um, from IT shops, uh, then that's like a real problem because that means you kind of have to import um, Linux machines from abroad or whatever, which kind of uh, really concerns me because that's going to drive the price right up. But anywho, enough of my rambling on. Apologies again for this video being just so long, but if you've made it this far, thank you. Um, and that's a very sincere thank you as well. Um, let me know down in the comment section below if you've made it all the way to the video. And um, and uh, and if you have any questions, and then I'll try and get on those. Um, that's about it for me today. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and uh, you've been awesome. Take care now.